next speaker is P.C. Myers. Uh, Professor Myers is well known in the scientific circles as a leader in the field of EMO-DEVO, or Evolutionary Developmental Biology. However, his even bigger following in the humanist atheist world due to his blog, blog Ferengi, and his talks across the country against intelligent design. Matter of fact, I noticed his uh, tie. He's got the famous crocodile tie on too. So if you haven't checked it out, you've got to go look at that. PC pulls no punches when it comes to pointing out the fallacies of religion, superstition, and pseudoscience, and was named the 2009 American Humanist Association's Humanist of the Year. PC Myers. Okay, hey, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be taking a rather more narrow focus than some of the previous talks. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to do what I normally do in my blog, which is find something that really, really irritates me and rant about it. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, I'm going to talk about this one issue that really is important to me, and that, that's, that is that I'm a science educator, first and foremost. I'm also an atheist, and some of you may have heard I'm a rather loud and militant atheist. Uh, there are a few things I've heard more than once in my career uh, that, uh, that, again, I find extremely irritating. And so I'm going to get that out of my system right now. One thing I've often been told is that I must find proselytizing for atheism far more important than teaching science, because obviously uh, some people find atheism scary. Aren't I worried that the association between atheism and science uh, will drive people away from good science education? Some of you must have heard this argument before. Maybe it's just me, because I'm particularly rude, but uh, I get it all the time. Uh, the argument, though, has a, pro has a couple of problems on a couple of levels. Uh, one is that I, I tell everyone it is not my job to reaffirm your delusions. I don't get paid for that. And if re reality terrifies you so much that you want to run away and join a freak show, I'm not going to tailor my message to accommodate intellectual cowards. Another issue is that if you think atheism is scary, you shouldn't look into science at all because science is far more scary than the idea that there isn't a God. But let me introduce the question in a way that is, is less likely to make me angry. I, I guarantee you do not want to see me when I'm angry. Uh, but I, I don't want to refer to just the apologists for religion who do this. So I'm going to consider a sincere question from a friend, a friend of science, a friend of mine, uh, somebody who's generally an all-around good guy, and that is the uh, physicist Lawrence Krauss. Uh, a while back, he did a little dialogue in Scientific American magazine with another guy you may have heard of, Richard Dawkins. And, and Krauss asked a form of this question I just told you irritates me so much. He said, I wonder which is more important, using the contrast between science and religion to teach about science, or trying to put religion in its place. And he suspected that Dawkins wanted to concentrate more on the first place, or on the second one. He's wrong, but OK. He'll, Richard Dawkins answered it. And then he says, you know, teaching is, is seduction. And I agree with this as well, that what you want to do is, is make people want to learn. Telling people, on the other hand, that their deepest beliefs are silly, even if they are, and that they should therefore listen to us to learn the truth, ultimately defeats subsequent pedagogy. So what I'm going to do is, I'm, for the next little while, I'm going to talk about answering this question. Uh, and I have to admit, Richard Dawkins answered it. And he answered it very well. He answered it much more briefly than I can. Uh, what he said is, uh, in reply, that it's a good idea to seduce people with your ideas. But nobody admires a dishonest seducer. And that's fundamentally the issue here is that one of the things we rely on is science is the trust people have that we will say the truth, even if it is scary or unpleasant or uh, something that contradicts what you want to be true. So the thing is, it's, it's a key point that, that the role of the scientist is to be honest to the evidence. 
not to your fantasies. And when we start fudging our answers to meet the expectations of an audience, we've already thrown away the one thing that makes a scientist an ar honest arbitrary, ar arbitrator of the data. Another reason is that if scientists are asked to be silent on issues of science, who is going to speak out for them? I want to talk about one of, uh, one of the many recent stories from the front lines of creationism that have annoyed me. Uh, this one is from a very good school in an affluent Connecticut suburb. Uh, it's, it's, it was in, published in a recent issue of, of Wired magazine. And uh, it's, it's one of these kinds of things that, that infuriates me endlessly. What is, is it's the story of a, a really good science teacher. Mark Tangerone is a science teacher in the third to fifth grade at the talented and gifted program of Weston School. So that's, that's a pretty prestigious position right there. You already you know that this is a guy who's, who's got to be putting in a fair amount of thought into his curricula, and he's got to be doing it for the benefit of students that have been selected to be especially smart, especially knowledgeable, especially willing to work hard. So he published, he put this together, he put a little, a little curriculum, he said, okay, what we're gonna do in this next year is we're, we're gonna, to learn about Darwin, we're going to have this, we're gonna break the students apart, they're gonna investigate the different places that Darwin stopped at, uh, they're gonna put together the story that Darwin did by looking at, you know, comparative biology. Which sounds like an excellent idea to me. I could use this at the college level even, because I can tell you that college students don't know much better, know, know evolution much better. So here's this great idea, uh, he proposes it, and then we know what happened next. It was rejected by the school administration. The school administration actually sent out letters to, to the teachers, and uh, cleverly, uh, this, this teacher published this letter, so we know what he said. Uh, the, the logic of Principal Mark Robbins, or Mark Ribbons, excuse me, who shot this down is, is really interesting to examine. Uh, here's what he said. So, while evolution is a robust scientific theory, okay, that's good, he's admitted it that far, it is a philosophically unsatisfactory explanation for the diversity of life. Okay, already I want to throttle him. What's unsatisfactory about it? I mean, it, actually, I shouldn't throttle him, I should send Dan Dennett to have a conversation with this guy. Uh, it's, it's a very satisfactory explanation, it's just the most powerful explanation we have for the diversity of life. And then he says, I couldn't anticipate that a number of our parents might object to this topic. Note the word there, anticipate. No parents have complained. No parents know about this. He is anticipating that they might complain. And on this basis, he shuts the whole thing down. He says, no, you're not going to do that. This is, you know, I use the phrase intellectual cowardice. The, this, this is Mark Ribbon's the poster child for intellectual cowardice. And you know, he's saying, he's saying this is not appropriate for kids. This sounds like a great program for kids. But it was, it was canceled. Now, it gets worse. The next paragraph of Ribbon's letter is this one. Okay, evolution touches on core belief. Again, I agree with the first phrase in this, in this little letter. And yes, do we share a common ancestry with other living organisms? And did he get the memo? The answer there is yes. <laughs> we worked that out very thoroughly a long time ago. Uh, what does it mean to be a human being? Okay, that's a trickier one. Uh, it may not be something that you can entirely answer with science, but you gotta think about these things. And he says, I don't believe that this core belief is one that you want to debate with children or their parents, and I know personally that I would be challenged in leading a 10-year-old through this sort of discussion. In modern educational parlance, Challenge is a dirty word. It's something you don't want to do with your teachers. It's something that you don't want to do with your kids. You want them all to be very comfortable with the ideas. I hate that. I, I try very hard to make my students extremely uncomfortable in the classroom. And I do a darn good job of it. And I think all teachers should be doing that. This is our job is to, is to challenge them on these issues. And then, then the killer is here. Uh, he says, we have to maintain the appropriate sensitivity to a family's religious beliefs or traditions. Well, isn't that sweet? I think I could do that because they did use the word appropriate. And I think that means that a pack of cherished superstitions shouldn't trump the evidence and reason. And I could probably say it in the classroom without even using the word bullshit once. <laughs> but it would be a strain. 
Okay. <laughs> so uh, this, is, this is a violation of the whole principle of education. And this guy is running the school. Uh, and education is supposed to make you think. It is supposed to confront you with new ideas. It is supposed to be a challenge that makes you stronger, deeper, and smarter. These are the attitudes of someone who thinks education should comfort, reassure, and never, ever change the ideas that you had to begin with. This is education as a form of religion. That is why I think education as a form of atheism is far superior. That's one of the things we like to do in atheism, is we like to think critically. We like to be skeptical. We like to pursue the evidence. This is exactly what you want in a science classroom. Now, I, I've got to mention one other argument that's often made along these same lines, and, and I've, I've got to mention another philosopher. Uh, this is Michael Ruse. Some of you may know of Michael Ruse. Uh, Michael Ruse actually did some good work for us years ago in 1987. He testified before the Supreme Court and managed to strike down, to help strike down some laws that restricted the uh, teaching of evolution in the school. So, you know, in that sense, sounds like a good guy. Except lately he's gotten kind of dotty. And, and what he has said recently is that a science teacher who taught evolution without mentioning the Bible or God, but nevertheless caused a conflict within a student who was indoctrinated into creationism, was attacking that student's belief and therefore violating the Constitution. <laughs> Think about that that there's all kinds of crazy ideas out there, and if we actually argue with our students, if we suggest that maybe you ought to be uncomfortable with the idea that the Earth is 6,000 years old, um, we are violating the Constitution. Wow. Well, uh, this, is, this is Michael Roos, and I have to say that I'm contractually obligated to point out a simple fact every time I mention him, and that is that he is a clueless gobshite. Uh, <laughs> I have to do this because I said it once, a couple of years ago about him, and ever since, every time he gives a talk and every time I meet him and we have a conversation, he points the fact out that I called him a clueless gobshite. And I think I made him cry. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm keeping a tradition here. If he ever complains about it, I'll just tell him that I'm maintaining my traditional folk ways and you cannot argue with me on that. <laughs> But okay, I would have a serious question for Ruth. If, if you were right now, I, I'd, I'd love to talk with him about this. Uh, if we were to teach science without conflicting with some students' devout beliefs about religion, if we can only discuss those things that are in agreement with the revelations of religion, uh, what do we have left? This is, this is a map of world religions, and they're all over the place. Uh, the Protestants are up there in red, the Catholics in blue, there's various animist religions around the, 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 there, there's Buddhists, there's Hindus. Uh, there's a huge diversity of religions on this planet. Uh, and uh, furthermore, there's all the, you know, what's not shown here is all the little cults and sects within them. I, I live in a tiny town in Minnesota, Morris, Minnesota, population 5,000 with 15 churches. And they all disagree with each other. We've even got four different versions of Lutheranism right there in that one little town. Though that isn't shown in this map, the kind of detail that, that you have to break everything down into. Uh, what are we supposed to do when we've got a classroom that contains a couple of different versions of Lutheranism, a couple of Catholics, uh, a few Hindus, and a couple of Mis Muslims? You know, th this, this is talking about institutional paralysis. You could not say anything that could possibly confront them. Uh, what we're doing is we're asking teachers to negotiate a minefield where the mines occupy every square centimeter of space. And I would further add that there are some really strange ideas out there. Do I have to teach so that I don't make Ray Comfort uncomfortable? LAUGHTER 